Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and we're here with another video on our YouTube channel to help you improve your game. We're trying for 5,000 subscribers. I think we're 30-some short, so if you haven't subscribed or you haven't told your friends about the channel, i uh, greatly appreciate it if you could take a minute to do that. Um, today I thought we'd look at uh, some puzzles by Jeff Coakley in his great intermediate book, Winning Chess Exercises for Kids. But before we did that, uh, I had someone suggest that they thought the board that I was using was a little hard on their eyes. Nobody else has complained, but I said, well, I'll try a different board. So I'm using a, a different layout for my board. I can, can pretty much control the type of colors and the type of layout that I want. So if you find this board a little bit easier on your eyes, uh, drop me an email and let me know through my website, danheisman.com. Anyway, so Jeff Cookley has this wonderful book called Winning Chess Exercises for Kids. And I consider it the best intermediate tactics book around. Don't be fooled by the title. If you compare it with a well-known book like A Thousand and One Combinations and Sacrifices uh, by Fred Reinfeld, this book is like better in every way. It has better problems. It has better answers. It has better layout. It has a computer checked, so it doesn't have the kind of bugs that the other book has. And on every page, Jeff has a certain layout. He has three problems where you have to win material. He has three problems where you checkmate. His seventh problem is find the best idea. The eighth problem is usually kind of an end game, or maybe the seventh problem is an end game problem. The eighth problem is a find the best idea problem. And the ninth problem is maybe another end game problem. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll have to take a look. Oh, maybe, no, the seventh problem is a defensive problem. The eighth problem is the find the best idea. And the ninth problem is the, is the uh, end game. Anyway. So I thought I'd pick this one. This is the seventh problem. So as a hint, this is like supposed to be a defensive problem. So let's do this problem together and maybe we'll do a couple defensive problems and then we'll do a couple of best move problems for this video. All right, so the hint is that this is a defensive problem. Why is it a defensive problem? Well, first let's count the material. White has a rook and a pawn for a bishop and a knight. That's usually a really, really bad thing that you have a rook and a pawn for a bishop and a knight. Now, if they're the only pieces on the board and your pawn can become a queen, well, that's a whole different story. But when there's lots of pieces on the board, bishop and knight is almost always better than rook and pawn. All right, so in this position, white has a deficit, and it's his turn, and he needs to do something here. Well, okay, let's look at some of his moves. Um, he could try to trade off when you're losing, get rid of the pawns, but obviously D takes E4, Knight takes E4 check, forking the king and the rook doesn't look very good. Now that we notice that the knight can do things, black actually has a threat. He has the threat of playing knight A4, and then wherever white moves the rook, he could play knight takes B2 and then push that pawn down and become a queen. So black actually has a winning threat already. For instance, it doesn't do any good to play d4 and try to remove the guard on that pawn on b3 because after d4, knight a4, rook takes b3 is not possible because a bishop takes b3. So removing the guard on the b3 pawn isn't the right idea. And in fact, letting him play knight a4 looks like a pretty much losing idea completely. Let's show you that just to see how bad this is. Let's say white plays d4, black plays knight a4. Now notice white doesn't have any entry points into the into the back of, the, of black's position here. So this is getting even worse. Let's say he plays rook to c1. What else could he play? Knight takes b2. Again, he can't skewer because the pawn's guarded. He brings the king over maybe. <clears throat> knight comes back here. The king can always come up as well. King comes over. Pawn up. Rook blocks, <clears throat> bishop hits the rook, king guards. In this position, black could just bring his king up. He could take the rook, of course. King up. If white ever pushes the pawn, the king can just go take it right away. White really has nothing to do. He's almost in Sugzvang. Let's say he moves the rook away. Black can bring the king up again. White says, I don't really have anything to do. Moves the rook back again. Now we can take it, and when he takes it, we can probably play king here, and when he tries to get a queen, we'll play checkmate. checkmate. So we can see that white's in some trouble. All right, so what should white do about it? 
Well, now we're getting a little desperate. We can see that doing nothing doesn't work and trying to remove the guard doesn't work. So maybe we can set up some sort of fortress where black can't get in. But in order to do that, we have to figure out what pieces do we want to have left on the board. And now we notice that all of white's pawns, except for the one on d3, are on dark squares where the bishop can't attack them. So maybe we could get rid of the knight and somehow block the king from coming in and get a draw. If you don't realize that you're playing for a draw here, and you don't realize that there are possibilities for setting up, you know, blockades and setting up um, fortresses, then you might miss this idea completely. So I think the right answer here is you should take the knight. Obviously, black's going to take black, and now you check him. That puts the pawn, all the pawns on the opposite color, the bishop. Black would love to bring this king in here and, and win, but if he plays king here, we can play king here, and king to d3 is not possible. So let's say black doesn't do that. Let's say he says, I'm going to get the bishop here first to get the king out of the way. So, he, so first he moves the king over to here, and white comes to e2, bishop c4 check, king here. Notice the bishop can't make any progress in here. Let's say the bishop comes over to f1, trying to hope to get the king here and the king in. Well, what can white do? White can go after the bishop. All right, so let's say black now moves the bishop away. Bishop h3. We can still come in and stop the king from, from getting in here. Let's say white plays uh, king to d1. And as soon as black plays here, white plays here. And now black would play here and try to zugzwang him and get the king in. But once the bishop does that, maybe the pawn can queen. Let's see if that's true. Let's see if we can move our king out of the way <clears throat> and get a draw here. King to, I don't know, c1. King d3, here we go. Pawn up. Can the bishop get back and catch him? I don't think he can. So this idea of putting the bishop over here doesn't seem to work. But let's go back to the start. Rook takes, king takes, pawn here, king here, king here. If the bishop goes here and doesn't come around like this, and he just stays on this diagonal, then white will simply move the king around the d2 square, and as soon as black goes here, he'll pop back up to here, and black can't put him in zugzwang here if he plays bishop here, white can play king to e2, and now black still can't get in. If he moves the king over here to b4, then we play here, and he still can't get in. That's why originally I tried this idea of getting the bishop up over here to let the king come in, but Jeff Coakley has cleverly created the position where if the bishop does that, he's locked out of defending against the pawn, and as soon as the king comes in to the third rank, he can't win. So let's do that again. King to e2. Bishop checks. King here. Now the whole idea of this bishop is to zugzwang the king so the black king can get in. Bishop to f1. White says, can I take off the bishop? Yes, he can, because after king here, king takes king here. White's going to get the queen first. King here, pawn here. King takes, pawn here. King here. Whoops, sorry. Pawn d7. King c2. Queen here, and now white has probably a win here. Certainly has at least a draw, but he could just check him. Um, but black's definitely not winning here. All right, so after rook takes, king takes, d4, king b4, king here, bishop here, king here, bishop here, king here. We don't think that the king can come in. If he tries to get the bishop this way... We try to block the king. Bishop checks. We already looked at this line. King here. King here. Let's say bishop here. Uh, it's white's turn. White's now in Sugsvang. He has to go away. The problem is, how does black get in front of this pawn without letting this pawn queen? We looked at something like this. King here. Pawn here. And white's going to get the queen first. And the bishop just can't get back in time. King here, pawn here, bishop here, pawn here, bishop is too late. So black may as well just try to get another queen, but it's too late for that too. 
king there, pawn up, pawn up, pawn queens, pawn here, and now white could do something like pin that pawn, and black's going to be very happy to draw here, probably can't, so black would want to do this. If black has losing chances in this position and he could just get a draw for doing nothing, why would he want to get into something like this? So the logic here is you want to take the knight, lock up the position, and try to win. Let's see if Stockfish can figure that out because Stockfish, in order to see this, has to realize that he can create a barrier. I think Stockfish will see it, not because he's going to see the barrier right away, but because he's going to see that everything else loses terribly. All right, so let's turn on the analysis here. Okay, Stockfish says rook takes c5 minus 0.97. Minus 0.88. Notice when you're in these endgame positions and the computer looks further and further ahead, he's going to realize either the value of the uh, evaluation is going to go down, or if it just stays steady around like minus 1 or something, minus 1 would win the game early in the game because eventually you can get it higher. But if he's looking 63 half moves ahead like he is here, if you look at the number of moves ahead he's looking at, it's now 64 half moves. He's looking at 65 ply ahead and he doesn't see that number going toward, you know, made in 23 or something, then it's a draw. Let's look at the second best move. Second best move, minus 10. All right, so that, that's why Stockfish sees this, because everything else is hopeless. So this is a good Jeff Coakley puzzle. Let's pause the video and I'll set up another one. Okay, we're looking at Jeff Coakley's winning chess exercises for kids. And we started out with a defensive problem. Here's another defensive problem. Okay, it's white to play. And what should white do? Well, clearly black is threatening to just play either rook takes e4 or bishop takes e4 and win the knight. What can white do about that? All right, when you're in these kind of pins, you have to look for either various ways to save the piece or maybe ways to counterattack that'll get you out of it. So there's only a few ideas that you could play. If you play rook to e1, black will simply take off the knight and the queen's in front of the rook, so that's a counting problem, and that doesn't work. So the number of defenders and the number of attackers isn't always tell you what's safe. Rook e1, we look, it looks like white might be okay with two defenders against two attackers, but the queen's in front of the rook. So if black simply plays something like rook takes e4 and gets the knight, then white can't recapture and end up ahead because he has to give up his queen to do that. So rook e1 is out. That means we're down to only a few ideas here. We would either have to play f3 and guard the knight with a pawn so that we can recapture, or we would have to counterattack the queen somehow with knight f6 check or knight c5. So those are our candidate moves. Well, let's look at knight f6 check first. Knight f6 check first, we think we can just eliminate that. If he takes with the pawn, how did that help us? It doesn't. The rook on e8 is guarded. We don't have queen takes e8. So... Knight f6 check is silly. That means we're down to two moves, f3 and knight c5. All right, let's try each one of them. Which one would you like to try first? Let's try f3 first. All right, so f3, if black does nothing and he just moves his king back and forth, we can get our queen out of the pin. We could play something like queen to f4 or something, something like that. So black wouldn't do that. If black takes the knight, bishop takes e4, we could take with the pawn, and that pawn's isolated and a little weak, but I think we can handle that. So the move we're really worried about on f5 is f5, hitting the, the knight with a pawn. When you have something pinned, you want to keep attacking it, and especially you want to do what I call AWL, attack with something worth less. Well, what's worth less than a knight? It's a pawn. So we're looking at f3, f5. Now white looks like he's in trouble, but he has a queen check. He has queen b3 check. So we'll visualize that. If you can't see it in your head, try to practice doing that. But if you can, I'll move the pieces in a minute. But for right now, let's do it with visualization. All right, so f3, queen to b3 check. Now a pawn is attacking our knight, and our queen is checking him. If he gets out of check by moving the king, then we just move the knight. We're fine. If he puts the queen in the way, we can trade queens and move the knight. We're fine. What's the big problem is what happens if he attacks the queen with the bishop? If he attacks the queen with the bishop, then 
If white just moves the queen, then black will take off the knight. So now white has no choice. He has to play something like knight c5 to counterattack, but then black can just play b takes c5 and win the knight. He could also play bishop takes b3, but then after knight takes d7, I don't think that works. All right, so what are we looking at? If you're not good at visualization, we're looking at f3, threatening to just move the queen out of the way and get out of the pin. f5, hit the knight with something where it lasts. If white does nothing now, black will just take the knight with the pawn. Now white could play a move like queen to d2. Now that's interesting because black can't take the knight. If he takes the knight, we'll take his queen. If he takes the queen, we'll take back with the knight. If he saves the queen, then we'll save the knight. And black doesn't have a check. Aha! This is getting very interesting. So this is a possible defense. Let's look at the other possible defense we are looking at before. Queen to check. But then bishop in the way, and now if we move the queen, he'll just take the knight. If we move the knight to f6 check, he'll just take it off. So let's say, let's look at knight c5. Knight c5, if force comes to worst, black can just take the knight. As we said before, bishop takes, knight takes is probably not the right way to go. He'll just take the knight, and black is up a piece. All right, so now we're seeing that after f5, White can play queen to d2, counterattacking the queen. Notice it's important that we're counterattacking the queen with, with a piece that's guarded by the piece that's attacked. The point being that if he takes the queen, we can take back with the knight, and we get away with that. So that seems to work. All right, let's, let's try our other defense, which is to play knight c5 right away. But if we play knight c5 right away, then black can play b takes c5, and the fact that if he took our queen and we took his queen would be nice, but he doesn't have to take our queen. He could just take the knight. So knight c5, b takes c5 doesn't work. So it's starting to look like the only defense is to play f3 and after f5 play queen to d2. If you didn't find that, then you're probably going to lose a piece. Let's see if Stockfish agrees with me. Mr. Stockfish 15, let's turn you on here. Stockfish 15 says you could do that right away. You don't have to wait for f5. Okay, so let's take a look at it. F5, F3, F5, Queen D2. Yes, that does work. Stockfish says I could use the exact same thing immediately. I don't have to play F3 first. F3 does work. If we show it here, it's, it's not quite as good, but it does save the piece. So we could play the same idea. We could just play Queen here. If he takes the Knight, we take his Queen. But if he takes with the Queen, we take back with a Knight and we avoid all the problems. So one way or another, whether it's after f3 or whether it's right away, you need to find this idea of queen to d2. Queen to d2 is the only saving defensive move. Again, we're looking at Jeff Copley's winning chess exercises for kids, not just for kids. I recommend this book for people rated over at least 1600, because if you're lower than that, you probably need easier books like, you know, Everyone's First Chess Workbook by Giannatos or John Bain's Chess Tactics for Students or my book, Back to Basics Tactics. This is really an intermediate book. All right, let's do at least one more problem. Let's do a problem, as we said at the start, for this for best idea. Let's do the same page. Let's hold on here. We'll pause. All right, this problem, unlike the previous two, is a find the best idea problem as opposed to the problems that we just did, which were defensive problems. How do you save things? In the first problem, we were trying to save a draw in the end game. The second problem, we're trying to get out of a pin. This one is, what's the best idea? Okay, well, and I, and I haven't looked at the answers yet, and I don't remember doing the, this problem. If I did, it's been a while. So I'm kind of doing it new with you as we do the video. It's not like I already know the answer. All right, so in this position, white is a lot better than black. He's a lot better for a couple reasons. One, his king is more active. Two, his rook is more active. And three, his pawns are more advanced. When you're in a rook and pawn endgame, if you have the better pawn structure, that's important. If you have the better king, that's important. If you have more active rook, that's important. If Usually if you have an advantage of two, two to zero, you're probably winning. Three to zero, you're definitely winning. If you have the advantage of only one, being one to zero or two to one, then sometimes your opponent is on the bad side of a draw. But here white has at least a two to zero advantage. But what's white's problem? His problem is that black's king is just going to walk over to f8 and e8 and eject that rook from the seventh rank and then play rook to d8 and offer the trade of rooks 
And even though White's king is more advanced, I don't think he can win. So let's let's try doing that for the moment. Let's show you why why the, why it doesn't work to kind of do nothing. So king here, king f8, let's say c4, king e8, rook back, rook d8. Okay, what's white going to do here? Well, if he gives up the file and tries to come down here, let's say he plays rook here, then black could probably just play king here, and if rook here, maybe even pawn here. And this has got to be a, an equal position, if not better for black. Mr. Stockfish, what do you think if we got here? Stockfish says zero, zero, zero. Okay, let's go back. Let's trade rooks and see if we can do that. So here, rook to d8, rook takes, king takes. We can try breaking in with f5 or g6. I don't really think they work. Let's ask the engine again. Mr. Engine, what's this? Zero, zero, zero again. Okay, so this doesn't work. So why did I do this first? Because I'm trying to figure out if black has a threat. Black's threatening to get rid of all our, our advantage by playing king e8 and then rook d8. So if white has to do something, he's got to do it fairly quickly. Well, that means we need to do something active. And the only active moves on the board right now are f5 and g6. So those become our biggest candidates. Let's analyze them. If we play f5, then in some lines we're threatening just to play f takes e, f takes e, and then he can't eject the rook from the seventh rank. Let's show you that too. f5, if he does nothing, he brings the king over, we take the pawn. If we take back, we can, let's say, push our pawn up here, and now he can't play king e8 because we have rook takes pawn. And now white can try to make some progress by moving up his queenside pawns or maybe bringing his king up to the queenside or maybe playing rook to f7 check. Let's say black does nothing, he plays a6. We could play rook checks, and if the king goes to e8, we take the pawn and we win. And if the king goes to g8, we play here and we win this pawn. So there's definitely possibilities to make progress. That means if white plays f5, black pretty much has to take that pawn. Now, how does that help white? Well, white can now come up with his king and attack the pawn, but black could save it with the pawn. So let's see what happens there. And this time we'll move it for you so you don't have to visualize. Pawn up, e takes, king f4, let's say black holds. Has white made progress here? Well, maybe we could sack a second pawn and bring our king in. Pawn here threatening to, to take here and here. Black doesn't have to take, but if he does and goes up two pawns, white can play here and now bring the king in and win all these pawns. You might say, well, this is crazy. Why, why would white do this? Well, let's say black keeps doing nothing. King here. Then white could threaten to... Take, he could start taking the pawns and threaten the queen with this pawn. Let's say king here. And black says, oh, let me run in and get a queen. King takes. If he keeps running with these pawns, maybe white can play... Oh, I don't know. Can he play rook checks and then pick up the pawn? I don't know. It's possible. He can certainly win a pawn right away with king here, pawn here, king here, pawn goes here, and we come back and say, whoops. We're going to win this pawn in a move. So this is all possible. So pawn here, pawn takes, king here, pawn here, pawn here, sacrificing a second pawn, pawn takes, king here. If he now tries to guard that pawn, we can start taking off the other pawns. And then meanwhile, our king can still come in here and threaten all kinds of stuff. So this is possible. But, this, but when you see a good move, maybe you look for a better one. So let's look at g6 g6 threatens to take off the f7 pawn if he pushes the f6 pawn then this pawn on e6 is getting weak white can just play rook to e7 but let's say black instead takes the pawn we could win a pawn back right away with rook e7 or we could try marching our king up first let's march the king to g5 let's say he tries to guard the pawn with king here and now white says, oh, look, I'm going to get a passed pawn. I'll play rook here. And black says, I be better not sit with my rook here. But if he moves his rook away to counterattack, we could start taking all these pawns on this rank. Or we could take this pawn first and get this passed pawn, which the king is not in good shape to, to stop. So it's looking like g6 and f5 are both kind of promising. 
my guess is that g6 is the better one. Now we can't wait a move. If we bring our king up first, not only can he bring his king over, but he can play here and stop all the pawn moves. And now this is not so good. If we play f5 and he takes check and we go here and threaten to play g6, this is not as good as the other lines. So I'm guessing that the answer is f5 or g6. I don't want to take up the whole video trying to figure out which one's better. They're both promising. The one that has the least complications for for white and gives him the best is to just play g6 and break up the pawns. If black plays f5, we can always play rook to e6. Can we play en passant and then go after one of these pawns? I think we can, but I'm not sure that that's better. We could also bring the king up to h6 and then try to threaten to play rook h7, g7, and rook h8 and queen the pawn, but that's a little slow. Not impossible, though. So my guess is the answer is g6. f5 is interesting. All the other moves don't seem to make a lot of sense. All right, Mr. Stockfish, tell us what Jeff Coakley's answer is at the back of the book. Jeff Coakley's answer is g6. I'm sure. Let's see. Does f5 work? Stockfish says f5 is okay for white, but if black plays perfectly, he can get the draw. Still 0-0. Zero, zero. So, so your guess, Dan, is right. G6 is the one and only idea to break in. F5 is an idea, but G6 is the one that works. So that's the answer. So, so we've done two problems from Jeff's book on the defensive part and one problem here on what, what's the right move. As I said, on every page, he's got three win material problems, three mate problems, one problem on defense, one problem on what's the best idea, and then one end game problem. Is it possible an end game problem could also be the what's the best idea problem? Sure, we just gave an example of that. All right, if you uh, enjoyed the video, please tell your friends about my channel, Dan Heisman Chess. Pass the word. We're trying to get to those 5,000 subscribers. If you like the video, of course, you can do that. And we'll see you next time. Thanks.